All right, let's see, is this thing on? Testing, testing, yep, looks like it's working. All right, good morning, everyone. Um, welcome to week three. You've survived so far and you haven't quit, that's good. Um, I see that most of you are still here, so uh, haven't scared you away. Um, sorry I couldn't be with you this week or part of this week or however it's worked out. Um, so let's go through a couple things uh, for the week so that we can start with um, a reasonable foundation. Um, I picked this particular passage because I think it's a very, very important one. Um, there's a few that are very, very important overall, but this is one of the most, uh, most interesting ones. Um, in my vision uh, at night, I looked and therefore, uh, then there before me was one like a son of man coming with the clouds of heaven. He approached the Ancient of Days and was led into his presence. This is a very Old Testament language way of Daniel describing what he sees as Christ approaches the throne um, on the clouds of heaven. So there, there are a lot of significance in the Old Testament about these, and these are a lot of the passages that tend to be pretty much um, kind of just ignored or passed over in a lot of today's uh, world and that's really kind of unfortunate because this isn't some mystical ancient book in a hokey religion like the Jedi thing this is this is actually about Christ approaching um, what I think is a really really great name for God the Ancient of Days um, and he's led into his presence because um, this is a this is a passage where Daniel is laying out some of the um, future and what he sees and some of the the things that he is given insight to by the spirit that allows him to see some of the events that will be coming um, and there's all sorts of great language and um, symbolism here that is generally kind of ignored today and I think that's very unfortunate so um, this is um, this is very very interesting for this particular week because of how um, <clears throat> he is he is approaching God in a very very specific way in much the same way we want to be thinking um, very carefully about how we actually approach the drawing and things that we're doing um, in order to deconstruct what we see around us and be able to catch all of that um, all of the the symmetry and um, the con the conservation of design in the things around us. So as we start to think deconstructively about the things that are around us, um, there's a lot that we can learn. So um, for day one of this week, um, what we're going to focus on is partial extrudes, extrude cuts, uh, the importance of planes, and then I'm going to have you guys. Um, try and make maybe a couple different mugs or glasses um, and so we'll show some simple examples of uh, how to actually do those so let's go ahead and open up SolidWorks so as you start a new part you're gonna be looking at a few different things um, and remember we've talked a lot about sketch relations and sketch planes so we're gonna start a new sketch in this case before we just grab a plane real quick, uh, think about if we're going to be drawing um, something again, if we're going to be drawing something um, that we're going to make in a cylindrical shape with an extrude tool, we don't really want to do a front plane, we actually want to do something like a top plane. Um, and part of the reason that is, is we go to do something like a simple circle, so just a simple center point circle, so of some diameter, we'll say, um, uh, let's see, um, 25 point, um, 25.4. And this is about a one inch circle. So um, remember we can extrude this in order to get it fully defined. We wanna be in the habit of, of specifying what the um, what the radius is. So the radius here is one inch. That gives us a two inch overall diameter. Now it's fully defined and we can move on to um, our other manipulations. So 
when we go to do things like the simple extrude, because that's really um, one of the easiest ones to, to look at first, is we want to do a, we want to step out of that sketch, go to the features, and we're going to extrude that boss or base. And this is a big focus right now in this part of the class, is this idea of um, boss and base. How do you decide what is the base for whatever you're drawing, right? So this gives you the ability to set um, through a couple different means. We've kind of covered this a little bit. We're covering it again just to give you a reference point. In this case, we want it to be um, maybe about um, we want it to be maybe about uh, five inches tall. So here we can use our control and that mouse scroll wheel telling you guys if you haven't gotten yourself a mouse you really need to make that happen um, you even if you have to borrow it from your roommate just for this class you really need to get yourself a mouse that's really a big big thing um, so here we have a fully defined um, cylinder right fairly basic pretty simple but what we want to do is now we want to take um, another cylinder out of this right so anytime that we're doing 3D drawing and drafting we have to think about the idea that it's either additive or subtractive manufacturing that we're that we're thinking about so you're you're starting to try and think about how you would draw it as if you were making it using tools so in this case if you made a cylinder and then needed it to hold some um, liquid maybe you would start with a cylinder um, and then drill a hole in it well how would you do that well now we're going to need another sketch problem is we're out of the sketch plane now there's two different ways to do this and I'm going to show you both and then I'm going to want you guys to get some practice with both of these techniques because understanding their uses are really really important um, we've talked a little bit about um, the idea of the same sketch being able to be used for uh, multiple extrudes and multiple extrude cuts um, there's also the ability to choose different planes so depending on which plane we want to start with we could start at the bottom or we could start at the top for the sake of simplicity right now I'm gonna start at the top and select this plane and so now I have a sketch that's on this top surface if I want to change the view what I can do is go back up here easily so that I am now square relative to the top of the plane that I'm working with. So I can now do another circle and we're sketching this on the top and so maybe I want this to be a dimension such that this difference using our smart dimension is about um, like a restaurant glass about three millimeters ballpark um, how do I know that because reasons um, so here's what we're gonna do so you can see we have our sketch at the top and this is where you start to understand why it's really really important to use some different planes in order to get yourself reference features and make your life easier rather than harder um, as you get to the more advanced levels a lot of this you will probably do from a single sketch but it makes life a little bit more complicated in some regards and easier in others so right now we have everything fully defined and so we can move forward I want you guys to be in the habit of checking whether or not the lines are black in your sketches so that each time you are um, each time you're making a change you are starting from a fully defined sketch and you're not going to run into headaches later um, there's a lot of reasons for that so what we're going to do is an extrude cut um, we'll learn things like the hole wizard and revolve cut and other things later for now we're just going to focus on this extrude cut you're going to select that cylinder it already guesses that since that's what we did we're going to be making a cut and in this case we don't want to do blind through all we actually want to do in this case we don't want to do all the way to the bottom we actually want to do a few millimeters up 
from that. So if it's 127 millimeters, um, this is going to be 124 millimeters. So if we do 124 millimeters as an extrude cut, now we see we have a closed base and we have a hollow cylinder. Pretty neat, right? So now what I want you guys to do as a quick little exercise is get a little bit of practice with that and then we'll come back and show you how to do this same thing only using um, this just the one sketch on the bottom. So I'm going to undo all these steps and I'm going to undo the extrude and I'm going to edit this sketch. go. So I'm going to edit this sketch as the base sketch. So go ahead and pause here, get a little bit of practice with this, making a few different extruded shapes, um, and then seeing if you can do a recess cut to some different depths so that you can get a sense for how that tool actually works. So go ahead and pause here and then we'll pick up in a couple minutes. Alright, I'll assume you've already paused, so here's what we're going to work on. Um, now, instead, we're going to say, ah, I know ahead of time I'm going to be doing two different, um, two different things and I'm going to do an extrude cut. So, um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to edit this sketch to include another circle and I'm going to use our smart dimension to do the same thing and say I want this to be three millimeters. So now we have a fully defined sketch with both elements on the same sketch plane. So now, can we still do the exact same thing? Well, what we want to do is um, we want to say, okay, smart dimension's done. We're going to step out of that sketch. And now, in this case, it has made a hollow tube by just recreating the sketch. Well, that's not what we wanted it to do. Well, okay. How do we fix that? So we have to go up here and edit the sketch feature since we already had this done. If we didn't have that sketch feature, it wouldn't make the same assumptions. So um, what we're actually extruding is we're actually extruding both regions of this. So in this case, we don't want it to do an extrude of both of these. We want it to do just let's see. I'm going to go ahead and delete that extrude and customize it from the beginning. So the selected contours is what you have to um, is what you have to adjust. So clear the sketch, what you're doing is you're trying to take this region and this region together. So now you have a solid cylinder. Remember back in the past when I said that this can make your life a lot more difficult because the software is going to make some assumptions about what you're trying to do? This is exactly what I mean. You can still make it happen on a single sketch plane the difference is um, it's very easy to edit a single sketch plane rather than going back and figuring out which particular sketch that you changed those parameters on. So if I decide actually I want you to change the reset cut to a different diameter now you're gonna have to go back through and figure out which of those planes you did that on. So it's important to be able to understand how to balance both. Um, for now, you probably want to focus on using different planes um, like I showed you for the first example, but this is also a valid re um, this is also a valid option. So we still have the same sketch elements. We still have this. Now, what we want to do, if we're using the same base sketch on a single plane, then what we can do is do another um, extrude cut. So we're still out of the sketch right now. We can do another extrude cut, but this time 
what I'm going to be doing is I want to um, I want to focus on an existing sketch. So we're doing option two. We're going to do an existing sketch. So now you can see that it knows we want to do something. So it's taking a guess at what we're going to do. We did an operation on one side, so it's guessing we're going to do the operation on the other side. Unfortunately, like Microsoft, in this case, it guessed wrong um, because Windows is always trying to do the wrong thing at the wrong time. So what we're going to do here instead is we're going to redefine the region that we're using. So I'm going to clear those selections and I'm going to tell it, actually, I just want you to cut the inner region. See how that changed? And what I actually want to do is I actually want to change it to from a surface or a face and now that allows me to select this top face and look I can do an extrude cut it's projecting the sketch elements onto the same top plane without having to make another plane to keep track of and that's the power of this particular technique um, and there are times when one is more useful than the other but I'm going to try in each and every one of these examples to show you guys multiple options so that you have different ways that you can approach the same problem especially if you're getting stuck because I don't want you guys spending a lot of time frustrated about oh, I can't do this this is too hard I want you to be able to think oh maybe if I try it that other way he showed maybe I can make that work so sometimes one is going to be easier than another it's very dependent on what kind of geometry and shapes that you're using but in this case what we can do is the same deal 124 millimeters extrude cut and now in this case nope it should be 124 millimeters so this one um, this one actually did 124 millimeters this is supposed to be 127 that's our problem so 127 now the extrude cut we need to edit that to be 124 so that's correct so now we have the exact same shape as promised and we did it a completely different sort of way so now what I want you guys to do is you guessed it you try so we'll go ahead and pause here and then we'll come back and look at some other shapes So now that we've done a couple of these things, one of the other things that we want to do is we want to get a little bit more practice with um, some of these partial extrudes, and that'll give us a little bit more flexibility. So a partial extrude is taking a part of something, um, and I'm going to start with a completely new shape. So I'm actually going to delete uh, all of these features yes I want to delete those yes I want to delete those okay so I'm going to delete this and start with a new sketch so um, for this I'm still gonna do it on the top plane but I'm gonna do a little different sort of a shape um, I'm gonna take a center point rectangle and I'm gonna take a mm, I'm gonna take tangent arc on either end there we go so I've got a tangent arc and I want to do a slot cut through this shape so what I need to do is set smart dimensions so let's make this 50 millimeters and let's make this um, 150 millimeters so there's a there's a couple key dimensions and now I have set all of the other ones again noticing that you don't have to fully define each and every single dimension of each of these um, that's pretty important so there's a lot of things that we can learn from this but one of the key aspects is 
um, we can take these pieces and we can now um, delete a couple of our parts. Now we have, with our trim tool, we've created one solid object. So now what I want to do is I want to cut a slot out from that piece like this. And maybe this is some kind of a really strange washer or spacer. So what we're going to do is a partial extrude. Um, again, I'm going to use smart dimensions to set that and 15 millimeters is reasonable. And so notice that in that case we only have to do the one dimension to make it fully defined. Now what we're going to do is called a partial extrude. So we can extrude just a feature out of the shape or the sketch that we're doing. So this is what you saw the software assuming we were trying to do in the last example. And so now it understands, oh you want me to um, extrude what it, what this um, exterior shape is. So um, in this case it makes the correct assumption. Sometimes the assumptions are good, sometimes they aren't, but you always want to make sure that you've got the correct sketch contours selected. And now um, for this we can say maybe a hundred millimeters extrusion and there we are. So this is an example of a simple extruded contour from a two-dimensional sketch. So now what we want to do is, you guessed it, now I want you to practice some of these. And so uh, make sure to walk around and answer questions. And probably this will take um, the rest of the time remaining for day one. And then we'll pick up uh, day two um, a little bit later. Um, and I may be wearing a different shirt, maybe not. Um, it'll be a surprise. Hello everyone and welcome day two of this week, uh, so this should be Wednesday unless the future is wildly different than what I had originally imagined. Um, so we're going to go over several things today, uh, one of which is uh, same shirt by the way, uh, really important to note. So um, I may be able to get all of these three days done all in the same day, which would be amazing. Um, so day two, um, here's what we're going to focus on primarily. We're going to look at um, patterns and repeated shapes and then we're going to learn how to make uh, simple examples of erector set pieces. So taking some of the things that we've already done and learning how to do them in a repeated fashion so that we can make uh, parts with a lot of repeated patterns. Um, it's very very helpful as far as um, making a lot of different types of parts in SOLIDWORKS. Um, and then you guys are actually going to be making a rotary phone dial which is uh, attached to um, it's a picture that's attached to LoudCloud so you guys will have to look that up so uh, let's go ahead and open up your new best friend and uh, let's spend a little time working on this so we've talked a lot this week already about the importance of planes and managing sketches on those different planes so as we go ahead and start um, one of our new parts uh, what we're going to be making um, as an example is a, um, a plate. So we're going to talk a little bit about patterns. Um, so for this let's think of um, what would be a good example. Um, if you were to lay out a um, pattern from like a, like a grill grate um, or if you had an expanded metal pattern um, sometimes you'll see them in fire pits and different types of um, open flame roasting pits. Um, if any of you are from New Mexico, which at least one or two of my students are, um, you would know them as uh, green chili roasters. Um, so those are things that use expanded metal and they have a fairly regular kind of pattern. Um, diamond patterned aluminum and stainless steel and things like that. Um, they they all have the same kind of repeated pattern. So let's start with something on a top plane since we're thinking about something that's a a flat sheet and that's going to have some sort of hole pattern or some uh, raised feature pattern. Um, so let's take a look at how we might actually do that. So let's start with something that might become something like a expanded metal pattern maybe. So um, here we have a a center point rectangle 
So what we're going to do is we're going to say this is about uh, three feet by four feet. Three feet, and we'll do uh, we'll do three by five feet. Okay, so we have our rectangle. We have it's fully defined. Now what we're going to do is we're going to start doing some additional sketching. So what are we going to start with? Um, we're going to develop a pattern and then, or we're going to develop a shape rather that's going to be part of a pattern. So in this case, let's do, um, let's do something unusual, and let's do a seven-sided hexagon. And what we're going to do is somewhere on, somewhere along this line. Um, we want to think a little bit ahead about how we want to arrange the pattern. And so we'll look at some examples of how that works. So it'll be easy to have it coincident with this, um, this diagonal. One of the things that that gives you is a reference point that you can start. Um, another thing that you can do quickly instead is actually a couple um, corner rectangles and say maybe I want the center line to be at um, let's do let's do about three inches by three inches three inches by three inches I got it pretty close so eventually you get to a point with the scale where you kind of get a sense of what size um, that's gonna be and so this needs to be somewhere around three inches by three inches as well. So you're going to do three inches and three inches. That was really close. So now we will have a point at which those intersect. So now we can insert our seven-sided polygon here, and it gives us a center line. So what we've done is just given ourselves a quick little reference geometry um, by setting a, up a couple rectangles. We've got a reference geometry and we can pick the size. So in this case, um, probably about um, the circle diameter. It's going to be a little harder to use um, as, as an effective measure, but we're going to make it um, a nice round number and say um, 75. Okay, so 75 millimeter um, circle diameter. So that's going to be fairly straightforward for our seven-sided polygon. Now, how do we actually get this to repeat? Um, so this we're actually going to do, there's a couple different ways, one of which is mirror entities, um, but in order to mirror the entities, um, it's a little bit trickier because you have to select, for the case of a polygon, you have to select all of those lines in order to select the whole thing. Um, those are the entities to mirror, and then you need to mirror it about some plane. So each of those lines gets selected, and you would have to mirror it about a plane, or you could mirror it about the top plane or you could mirror it about another reference plane so this is where that power that I told you about early on about center lines comes in because you can by using these center lines you can change where you're using something like a mirror pattern so long as you think of that as a plane across which those particular sketch entities are going to be reflected so now what we're gonna do is we're going to use what's called a linear sketch pattern. There's a couple different ones, one of which is called a circular sketch pattern. So I'll show you that one briefly. Um, what we're doing as far as entities to pattern is we're gonna select this for the whole thing and it'll show you a circumference. And so depending on how this is arranged, there's a couple different things that it can do. If, for instance, we wanted to just have this pattern at all four corners, how would we do that? 
Well, it's a little bit tricky. Um, our circumference for the entirety of the angle um, can be um, it can be used. Um, there's a couple other things that you can define as far as the X and the Y. You can shift the center point of the circle to different places. In this case, that really won't necessarily help us. Um, but what you can do is you can change this angle up and down. And you can see what the effective number of degrees are. So this is, um, this is one dimension. Um, you can shift this center point back to 0, 0 as a quick reference. So you can change this to 0, 0. Um, if you are trying to change things, you can also change, I want this to only be 300 degrees of rotation. Okay, well that brings two of them into our corners, but this doesn't equally space two of them. We can say, well maybe I want eight in the pattern. We can see if we were making something like a wheel and we wanted evenly spaced pieces, 12 points. Um, each of those only going up to 300 degrees because I have that cutoff here. You're not seeing the last couple patterns. If I said actually I only want that to be 180 degrees, then you would only see the pattern here for 12 of them. Or if you went back to 360, you can see where all of these are evenly spaced. So you change the spacing by changing what the angle is that's limited, but here and here this isn't exactly the same spacing and because this is on a circle that's really not particularly helpful as a pattern. So for this type of geometry if we want a linear pattern obviously a circular pattern isn't really helpful, but if we were working on something else that required a circular pattern that's where we would use it. So the linear sketch pattern is the one that we would be using for this one. So the entities that we would be using for the pattern would be this one. So we're going to select the, not the actual circle, we're going to select all of the lines and then what we're going to do is we're going to be determining the number of copies and what the spacing is. So if we change this to 15 millimeters you can see this is only in the x-axis. You can change the direction of the x-axis using that direction change arrow, just like with a lot of the other features. And you can specify what the spacing is. So instead, maybe you actually want um, maybe you actually want about three inches on center. So maybe you actually want three inches on center. These are a little bit bigger, so maybe you actually want um, five inches on center. And that will give you a little space in between them. So now the question is, how many copies do you want vertical or, or along the horizontal axis now? So maybe we zoom out and we say, well, I want to do ten copies. Okay, ten fit, what about twelve? So that goes a little bit farther and we don't quite have even spacing. So maybe this has to be backed off and you can adjust it here by whole numbers of millimeters. In this case it seems like somewhere around 120 is actually probably closer, maybe about 122. 124. So actually probably somewhere around 124 is very, very close for the correct kind of spacing that we want. This assumes that they're evenly spaced across all of these. So it's 12 across um, 124. In this case, the arc doesn't really help you. You don't really want to change this unless you want a very special sort of pattern, right? Um, so 360 degrees relative to the starting point is actually what you want for horizontal. Um, but that's what these other axes do. And now you can say, I actually want two copies, three copies, four copies, five, six. We'll really confuse the drawing here. 
but the point is we can go up to 10 copies and here we're going to say again you want to do um, 124 millimeters except that's going the wrong way so now we want to change this oh well looks like 10 copies is quite a bit too many well, maybe eight copies or maybe seven copies but maybe the spacing needs to be a little bit more in this uh, y direction so along the y axis we actually maybe need um, 125 millimeter spacing or 128 millimeter spacing and so maybe that gets us actually pretty close to where we want to be um, you can set some of these other key dimensions but once you've established the key dimension for the first object here that you're using as the pattern now you can select since all of these are um, since all of these are now defined based on the pattern you can say based on these what I want to do is I now want to make uh, an extrude cut of just this plate itself and so we'll make like we're doing some sort of a, a hole punched plate right so we're going to exit the sketch then we're going to do a simple extrude and so it automatically picks the part that we're interested in um, you could also do you could also do each of these individually um, it's a little harder to do as an entire array but if you pick this and you have a let's say a quarter inch 0.25 inch so 6.35 millimeter this is what a perforated plate would look like so now we can view this uh, without the sketch by clicking off of it and you can see uh, that we have now just made uh, the world's least complicated cheese grater congratulations um, now just as it is in most classes it's your turn to continue from here and see if what kinds of uh, interesting repetitive patterns you can make using this linear pattern tool um, specifically in the sketch um, there is also a linear pattern for features um, we're not really going to focus on that at the moment um, but there are a lot of different um, aspects of patterns that we will be able to get into a little bit later so there's a lot to look forward to but for now see what kind of interesting geometries of cheese graters you guys can make so go ahead and pause here and then troubleshoot did you pause I sure hope so because it'll be really awkward if you're at the back of the room right now and uh, then it's not paused so um, we're going to continue on with some of the next skills. Um, one of the next things that you guys are working on today specifically is um, how to make uh, this DIY erector set. So this is another quick skill set that we can work on. So I'm going to go ahead and delete this. And we're going to delete the base sketch just because I'm too lazy to make a new part. So again, we're going to start with a top plane on this one. And what we're going to do is we're going to make a slot for the first one. Let's see. So we want to use Smart Dimension to set what some of these distances are. Again, we're aiming for a fully defined sketch. So an erector set is about, um, I'm going to say it's about uh, 19 millimeters. And I'm going to say this is about, um, let's say, 120. Um, no, let's say uh, it's a really long piece, so it's about 100 millimeters. Um, so now we have, let's see, that's going to be, that's going to be much too large. That's going to be, let's do, instead of 19, let's do 10 millimeters. 
Um, so something like that is probably much, much closer to accurate. So about 10 millimeters wide. Um, it's been a little while since I've used those. So about 10 millimeters wide and 100 millimeters long. Now, the um, we also want to set the radii for these so that our sketch is fully defined. All right, so for this, because we started with a slot, um, this is what they will count as being fully defined. Um, once we tell it, yeah, because this is going to be a, a driving dimension. Um, so even in this circumstance, all of those are aligned. So yeah, this is what they're going to count. Um, even though this line isn't black for a slot, this is um, defined in the way that it needs to be. So uh, what we're going to do is use the same tool that we're already familiar with, this linear sketch pattern. Um, we're going to make ourselves holes so we have a couple convenient places here so we're gonna say these are gonna be uh, about a radius of about two millimeters and we're going to have an overall yeah they're gonna be about two millimeters so this should be fully defined by saying what is um, by picking this so we've already set the dimension um, so because of the way the smart dimension is set up inside of slots you're not going to be able to define that as easily um, there we go I got it to pull a radius out okay so four millimeters is the radius. Now what we're going to do is, or is the total diameter. So now what we're going to do is use that linear sketch pattern. So here we're going to copy this. What we're doing is moving along the x-axis. We're not making any copies along the y. We're just going to make them along the x-axis and we're going to say these are going to be 10 millimeters on center and there should be um, think nine copies. No, it has to be ten copies. So total number is going to have to be eleven circles. So what we're doing there is we're having ten copies to go the entire hundred millimeter length. Um, there needs to be a total of ten copies. So this number for total has to include the original um, and that's one of the key um, factors of this. So you have to include the original, but this is an example of how you would set up a regular pattern for an erector set. So this is the same sort of idea. Um, now what you can do is easily step out of the sketch and do an extrude, and it already assumes that we're going to extrude this exterior volume, which is actually about correct. And we're going to do one millimeter. So um, relative to the proportions uh, that is probably about right. So now we have our our flat piece and this should look familiar to anyone who's ever played with an erector set and you can change the materials here by right clicking and edit materials. This is kind of a bonus thing that you guys are learning a little bit early. Um, for this, let's say, um, let's do a chrome stainless. So depending on where the light is, um, for this view, yours will probably not look like this. Um, you won't see, based on where the light sources are, you won't see the same level of reflections. It'll just show up as, uh, it'll just show up as probably a gray or a flat color. Um, that's okay, we're going to talk about um, photo view and, and rendering and things um, later. So we'll learn all sorts of things about that. Um, 
these uh, these features are heavily dependent on which kind of graphics card you have and whether or not it's in their approved list. Um, so this is an example of what a chrome plated um, piece would look like and that should look very very familiar. Um, so I think that scale is actually pretty close to accurate um, for what a what an erector set piece um, scale would be. So uh, probably not the exact dimensions. I wouldn't go out and manufacture your own copies of this based on the dimensions, but gives you a good example. So now it's time to turn it back over to you guys, and you're going to start working on designing that rotary foam dial um, and see if you can accomplish it, because that's probably going to take the rest of the class. It's a little bit challenging, um, but the advice I have on that is the simplification of making your phone dial flat on the edge instead of making it curved the way that it's pictured. Um, if you want to try and make it curved, um, you're welcome to do so, but that's going to be a combination of techniques that gets to be a little bit more challenging. Um, and then we'll go over when I'm back what uh, the process would look like if you were actually going to do that. So. Uh, go ahead and give that a try and go ahead and pause it here because likely this will pick up um, in day three for those contents. All right, I'm going to assume we paused and it's day three. Welcome back. You guys are still here and still alive. That's good. I see most of you and nobody's really ditching significantly yet. Well, that's good. That's probably also going to be good for your grade. Um, so what are we going to be focusing on today? Um, this is going to be a fairly straightforward day. Um, the idea is making sure to take any specific skill requests. Um, so how to better use uh, some of those features, some of the things that we went over um, earlier in the week, some of the linear patterning. Um, under the sketch tools and some of the things that um, are really really very helpful um, in terms of what we're doing and how to how to edit these so hopefully today there will be a little bit of question and answer and mostly what I want you guys focusing on is getting through the French curve assignment because that one can look a little bit scary at the outset but if you work your way through it step by step start from one point and establish your relations. So in this piece, I started from this end, and then I established my relations all the way to the other side. Um, that means that you can anchor your drawing and adjust using the smart dimensions. All the other features using all of the things that you guys have learned, all of the techniques, and you should be able to put all of those pieces together for this big assignment, even though it seems a little bit tricky. Um, so hopefully I will have been back by this day, but. Um, if not, um, then feel free to ask questions. Um, if for whatever reason um, there aren't answers that are working for you guys for those questions, um, I'll try and answer any of those when I'm back. So hopefully you guys get a chance to actually work on those. Um, and likely that is going to be the rest of the day because that's a pretty big project. Um, so make sure that you guys are working on that French curve um, and then make sure that again you guys are using your resources um, come talk to any one of us um, about questions regarding SolidWorks um, there's a lot of cool techniques that we're trying to teach you guys but they can be a little bit tricky or if you miss a step it can be a little hard so you may have to run back the videos and and look a little closer at a couple of those competencies um, and all of that's totally okay so um, make sure to make good use of your resources, ask questions in the private forum or the QI forum. Um, you can also ask your classmates if you're really struggling on something. You still have to submit the individual assignments yourselves, but you are allowed to say, hey, I'm really struggling with this. How did you get that curve? Do the stupid thing, right? And so that's a totally okay question to ask each other. Um, so focus on that, and uh, hopefully I will be back for you guys next week. Thanks. See you then.